Yay. All right. <laughs> so we're going to take notes. Yes. Uh, but I do want to go through the syllabus real quick here first, and then we'll go through it here the rest of the time. So let's jam. So this is the 21 22 school year. This algebra two. Uh, my name is Mr. Hanjiev. That's cool. There's my email address in case you need to get a hold of me. And then the textbook that we're using, hopefully you guys got it, is, looks like something like this. Are we good? So quick show of hands. How many do not have the textbook yet? Do oh, not. Still do. Yeah, do not, right? Oh, I, yeah, I don't know. I have it. No, no. Um, have it with you or have oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, have bought it and you have it as far as like you purchased it and you have it at yeah. home or here yeah. okay perfect okay so just want to make sure it is a pre-calculus textbook here there's but pre-calculus pretty much is algebra two and trigonometry uh, and we're going to skip the trigonometry part of the of the textbook all right everybody good there i'm glad so let's keep on going here so methods the way we think about this here is i'm going to we're gonna have class notes that we're gonna take. We're gonna have homework that we take. And we'll get a pencil that we get. And the whole point here is for you guys to develop a mindset of problem solving. I think that's the biggest thing, right? And just to ex explore this whole concept of, of, um, of math. But math is interesting because we're gonna deal with numbers. But hopefully you guys realize that the same mindset that we use is used for other things. So the way we sequence things, the way we try to figure out what we don't know. So hopefully we'll kind of build that into it as well. Uh, I assume that every hour in class here, you guys have about an hour on the off days of homework as well. So we should kind of expect that and we'll go from there. Um, what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about all these different things here. Complex numbers, arithmetic, geometric sequences, math induction. We're gonna have fun. That's what I say. Okay, the, quick, uh, the question comes up is the honor students, what is your extra stuff that you're gonna be doing? So you will have extra homework problems to do, first of all. Uh, they'll usually be more challenging. Uh, on each of the exams, you'll have an honor section that extends now the homework. So you'll have extra home, extra exam questions that you're gonna do. Uh, next is on the oral final or the verbal final. Uh, you will have a, a more questions to memorize to do as well. So that's kind of, there are sort of three things that we're going to do there. Okay. With that, let's jam. <clears throat> Materials, you guys hopefully have a book with you, a notebook with you, a planner with you as well. Uh, if you want to get a... Um, a notebook that is a gridded note notebook that's cool too you know the ones that have, i think it's called quadrule if you have that that's cool just makes it a little easier especially in mathematics to take notes and stuff okay and uh grades what is this grades worth here so everything is 20 percent of your grade as far as categories are concerned so 20 percent is your final exam so real quick here there are two parts to your final exam and then uh, there's going to be a written part, which I think you guys are used to. There's also going to be a verbal exam as well, or oral exam. That's part of the exam process. So yes, you're going to have to come up here, wherever we're going to put the whiteboard, I think, on, on this side. And you're going to memorize certain questions of the class, of, the, of your, there's going to be homework questions. But basically, you're going to present it to the class. And how well you present it, you get a grade for that. Um, in the European style, this is called the ballot system. Um, essentially like this, if you've memorized 15 questions uh, and you know them thoroughly, you those 15 questions should pretty much represent your whole entire semester's worth of stuff. Like you know how to graph certain things, you know how to solve a certain piece. So by memorizing, you know the whole entire semester. And then we do it again for the second semester. Cool system. It is part of the classical model here. And um, I think it's neat. Anyways, 20% uh, on exams and quizzes. 20% uh, something called a project or presentation. 
and something called challenge questions. Whew, so I will uh, put those up. We'll figure those out later, not today. So towards the end of the semester, you guys will have a project or presentation you will be giving. All right, 20% is homework assignments. And then 20% is just my assessment of you as far as participation in class. Good, that's kind of where we're at. Okay, any questions on the grading? Because it's kind of important. It's your grading in the class. No. Sure, usually uh, like maybe like 10% the first time and then 20% the next time and then 30% now you're at a C. Cool. Okay, some other stuff, late work, there it is. Thank you so much. Cool, and then parent role, it says it on the syllabus here, but pretty much if you wanna discuss stuff with your parents, it's kind of funny when uh, when the kids come back from school and parents ask, what did you do? And the obvious answer is nothing. Like what, you haven't done anything at school? Hopefully that's not the case for you guys here. So we're like, yeah, that was so cool. We've done this and this and this in school. All right, let's jam. So uh, grades, where will they be listed? They are gonna be listed in Google Classroom. I will send you a link sometime this week and you or invite, just respond to it. Then you get put on the roster there. You're still gonna turn in paper pencil homework to me though. So I'll collect it and your grade gets posted there. I hand it back to you, we're good. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, real quick, the due dates may not reflect on Google Classroom, may not reflect the true due dates of the assignment. I'll post it up what I think it's going to be. And then, um, but we should know in class what, what's it going to be. So as we have that. Okay, next, uh, classroom expectations. Here it is that you come on time prepared, which means you've taken a look at the previous homework assignment. You at least attempted it. That's one thing. Second of all, you at least uh, scanned the next section we're going to talk about. Super duper important. Um, and as we know, as we learn about memory and how we learn stuff, we learn stuff in three stages. We have to learn stuff in three stages. First stage is just getting just the vocabulary down. Like what in the world is a matrix? What is uh, confounding variables? I don't know, right? Just the vocabulary piece of it. So once you do that, then the second stage is now you start putting things together. So now you start figured out, oh, this process is used here, this process is used there. Whenever I see a two, I go this way. Whenever I see a one, I go that way. So there's that little understanding. And those tend to be, have to be done in separate times. And then the third part is for you guys to actually do the skills, we're good? So if you, totally encourage you guys to read this section ahead of what we're gonna be covering. If you know you're gonna be covering 1.3, at least take a glance at it do that. If you want to at least try some of the exercise problems in the textbook, go for it. That's cool too. Okay, so how does the class function here? I Please do ask questions if you don't understand something. That's the whole point of why you guys are here. We're good. Um, but please don't chatter away as we're lecturing. And then the whole point of education, I think in my mind, is you're having a conversation. Either taking it in and like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. That's so cool. Or like, Mr. NGF, I don't understand this. And so we have that conversation too. All right, we go from 8.40, 9.45. I just ask you guys sometimes to watch the clock for me. I get too excited about algebra two and I forget about time whatsoever. And so if I'm gonna get in close to time, like Mr. is 9.40. So then uh, just kind of quickly remind, or on Fridays, it's 9.20. Okay, are we good? Cool, jamming. So let's go with it here. The history of algebra, where did this all stuff begin? Let's go with it and then, We'll get into our stuff here. This one's still not taking notes yet. You'll be taking notes when we're, I'll, I'll tell you when to start taking notes. So this is just for us to understand. So a long, long time ago in the Mesopotamian Valley, uh, Babylon, we call it the Babylonian Empire. It was, it was bigger than that. Babylon or Babylonian Empire stretched pretty much throughout the whole no, known world. It was this global takeover. And one thing that they actually made is they made a universal language and they made a whole bunch of investments in, in mathematics. It was phenomenal what they did. Uh, so one thing is they made a, a, a system based upon 60. That was their, their uh, you know, we have a system based upon what, you guys? 
how many how many different characters do we have for our number system? Right? Base 10. Yeah, we have a base 10 system. Um, they had a base 60 system, so they had different, right? Different characters. They had 60 different characters. And once you in that, then you put two of them together, right? And then it starts a whole new system. <clears throat> and so we still use it today, right? In minutes and seconds. Is that still 60? So we have Babylonians first started looking at time because they were astrologers and they they did time for us. We still keep that same time. We're still base 60 in terms of minutes and seconds. Um, uh, also the fact that, that we have a circle, it's 360 degrees, right? That's 60 times six, because they divided the circle that way. We still divide the circle that way. Even though there is, there's a movement among mathematicians to divide the circle into 100. It's not gaining any traction. We still want to keep the 360. It's still tr so traditional. All right, they made a place value system. So if you had like a four over here and a five over here, that actually meant 45 which is way different than trying to string like four, zero plus five, which the Egyptians did. The Egyptians didn't have a place value. So they couldn't just write 45 as four and a five. They had to write 40 plus a five each time, which made it more complicated, didn't work as well. So they made a value which you can add, subtract, multiply, divide. That's kind of cool to me. They also knew quadratic and cubic equations already. They did fractions, they had formulas, they also knew, most likely they knew, we're not sure out, this jury's still out whether they knew the Pythagorean theorem or not. Because Pythagoras came about 200 BC, 250 BC. That's right, how about that? The interesting thing about history is uh, who takes the credit for what? Uh, so you have, um, there's a cubic formula there is a generalization for the cubic formula. Yeah, you guys have the quadratic formula. Did you guys, right, you guys know it? Anybody recite for me the quadratic formula? Lots of numbers. Lots of numbers, like x equals negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus. Dear God. This is like the Traumatic flash. Oh no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, all over four, four AC, all over two A. Is that right? Something like that. So that's a quadratic formula. So people probably say, and you guys will nod your heads. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. Where I was going with it. Oh, so uh, there's a cubic formula, right? And so in, in back in the um, back in the day. Uh, in order to hold a professorship in university, because there's only a few, right? You actually had math, well, you had contests to who's actually going to be the professor at the university. So uh, this is, so you'd give uh, three problems to the other guy to solve, right? And he would give you three problems. And if you could solve those, whoever solved better, they become the professor of the university. And so there's a person named uh, Tartagula. He was the professor of university, and he actually finds the cubic equation for a formula. Now we can solve anything that is, let me write it down here. So, come on, come on. so this is the formula. So x squared plus, you guys don't need to write this down. This is uh, a squared, b squared plus c. The quadratic formula is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That leads to this. And then you have the other formula. How about if you go to the third power? So the question is, is there a, is there a formula that could just give us the answer right away? Just like, just like that. So Tartagula, the professor, he's brilliant. He figures this out. And then there's a person that was vying for his, uh, vying for his uh, professorship. It's like, I know I'm gonna lose this battle if I don't know that formula. So he just takes him on a night out. And uh, I think it was Dr. Cardano, I believe. 
he and so he takes him on a night out they start talking they start drinking and he gets him to reveal the cubic formula <laughs> and he's like rocket awesome so that he comes back knows it all and then he gives him a problem he can't do so then he becomes a professor at the university so battle of math here crazy stuff okay we good there with that okay they were astronomers they predicted seasons they came up with the first calendar and they came up with something called archimedes screw archimedes was a mathematician again um he's a greek mathematician so that means he had to have come later but we call it archimedes screw because he popularized it it was known in the world uh, so it looks like this right here it could be made out of steel, could be made out of wood, whatever you like, but it's this screw that you get water and the water travels up. Uh, and then you had that, and so there's that. And then um, in the Greek times, let's see, Herod the Great, he had this humongous palace up on, uh, on this big hill. And what he did is he had several of these made so that he can get water all the way up on this big humongous hill. And he had this, um, yeah, anyways, and the whole entire Roman water system was made up of these right here. So in Babylon, what happened was, if you guys ever search here, something called the Babylon Hanging Gardens. And so they figured out a way to get water all the way up there by means of these uh, screw devices here. And I went to a theme park one time. I remember actually doing that. It actually said Archimedes Screw. I have to figure out where the picture is on that. That's kind of cool. Did that. Anyways, there's another picture of Babylonian hanging gardens. We, we kind of think from archaeology, that's kind of what it looked like right there. So they made a little fountain coming down. They had plants and stuff like that with this little invention. I thought that was kind of cool. Okay, now back to your algebra book. Now let's start. And so we are going to cover chapters one, two, three, and then we're going to skip a whole bunch of chapters. We're going to cover seven, eight, nine, and ten. Okay, the reason why we're skipping four, five, six is because that's trigonometry. That's for people that would like to continue math the next year. <laughs> and so, if continue math in terms of trigonometry next year, how about that? Gotta go from there. So my philosophy of homework is like this. We're gonna take notes. Some problems are gonna be just like the homework and some of them are just gonna be a tiny bit more complicated than that, okay? And so it's like, oh, I got to think about this one. And that's kind of what I want you to do. Okay. If you're super stuck on the homework, don't start throwing your book across the, the room here. Just come and ask me the questions on the next class period. We can, if we have time, we'll do it in class. If I just say, look, that's going to take way too long, I'll do a quick video and I'll send it to you guys. So we'll kind of do it that way. Okay. Also, notice that uh, there are answers, which you guys should know off of uh, there are answers in the back. Um, on the homework sheets that I'm going to pass out, all the problems that we do are all odd problems. So you do know whether you get the right answer or not. We're good. This is not you guys guessing whether you got it right. So let me pass out the, uh, the homework sheet. So I kind of try to measure it out so that um, so that's about an hour, hour and a half of work ish, somewhere on there for each section. Sometimes we might not even do a section. So say again. No. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so real quick, we're talk about so the BC there. That's called vocabulary check. At the start of each and every single homework assignment, there is some vocabulary. You jump to one point one, and just to make sure that you're understanding the vocabulary, since it is important. This little piece right here is the vocabulary checks. Right there, I'm only giving you the odd. Let's see, is it all of them? Let me just check in the back of the book. Okay, so the vocabulary check, it actually has, it has answers for all of them. Okay, 
So it's all the vocabulary, just to make sure you're getting the vocabulary there. Then afterwards, notice it's 1, 3, 11, 15, 23. And so it's the problems themselves. Keep on going. Okay, once you, into the, once you get to 65, those that are CAN students, you're done. Honor students, you still have 41, 43, and 74. A little bit more complicated, uh, usually is um, more thoughtful questions, and sometimes things are kind of blending things together. Something you should know from algebra one, how does this apply here? So stuff like that. Okay, are we there? So what is chapter one all about? Here we go. So I mean it so that you can kind of connect to. So 1.1 is just a review of graphing. So let's go ahead and put the graph paper stuff together. Also distance formula and midpoint formula. We'll do what we start today. Uh, 1.2, what's that all about? Is some basic stuff about graphing and some other stuff about graphing that you should remember from the one. 1.3, now we finally start graphing lines. Oof. You guys should know how to graph lines. If you don't know how to graph lines, that's not good. And then what happens? We start talking about functions in 1.4. What is that word? That is the famous word mathematics. We do a lot of things with functions. 1.5, we start looking at some more graphs. And 1.6, we look at, they're called the parent graphs, but I like mom and papa. And so then we start moving mom and papa graphs all around. And we make all the different functions that we pretty much have. 1.8 then says, let's start adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing these functions, and then also something called composing functions. What in the world is that? We'll find out in 1.8. 1.9 is something called the inverse function or the backward stuff of all we did so far. And then 1.10 is the modeling aspect. Okay, good. So there's your homework there. Any questions on this guy? How to do it? Go ahead. Um, so how are we separating up when to do the homework? So is 1.1, 1 .1, well, all of that, what we're doing tomorrow or for the entire week or? Uh, we will, I will kind of cut it off usually saying we went up only to this right here. And then we'll just do the homework for that portion. Oh. So sometimes we'll finish a whole section. Sometimes we don't most, uh, I don't know, 50-50, I would assume. 50% of the time we'll finish the section, 50 time. 50 times, 50% 50 of the time we won't. Okay. Any other questions? Good question. So I will try. Remind me at the end of each class, like if we didn't get through a section, remind me, like, Mr. Andrew, how far did we get? But hopefully it'll become evident as we as we see some stuff there. Okay. Let's jam. Uh, first things first, I'm going to give you guys two videos on how to take notes. We're good. And then we'll start taking notes. Before we do that, I want to just mention one little thing. Uh, on the side over here is these wonderful mathematicians that are super cool. But uh, I got these puzzles. Just so if you're bored, not during class, but uh, some other times. If you're bored, you're just trying to separate these two out. That's all. Super easy. Oh, I got before. It's not really Oh, no. Oh, no fun. No, I didn't. The other one. The other one. I've never oh, seen. This one? I've done the other from the first one that I've never seen. Gotcha. I, I will try to do this. I'll try to uh, just kind of change it up for you, but every month we'll try to do something different here for the different problem. So, anyways, I got these two. Um, and then for the fun of it here, I have um, yearbooks from two years prior. <laughs> if you want to see your face in there. And then, or others. And then uh, this one is actually these three books. These are actually from all, I just, it's a printout copy of this one right here, but it's also a little bit about their lives, like who is Galileo, anyways, and what did he do, his contributions. And then maybe like at a middle school level or early high school, there's like some things to do. Like, hey, let me try this myself. But if you want to thumb through it, uh, this was my first set of books, and then in a month or so, I'll put another set out. But if you just want to come through something to so look at that stuff, that'll be cool. Sometimes it'll be catch your interest, sometimes it won't. Okay, let's jam with uh, some note taking or how to take notes first. How we're going to do it in this class. Sort of the Cornell note taking podcast. Raise your hand if you have. Cool. Those that keeping your hands up, thumbs up if you like it, thumbs down if you like you hate it. Tremendous. I've heard of it, but I didn't know. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, so let's do this. The two people that hate it, 
profusely. Um, do you have to do it that way? No. Is it good? Is, do I think it's a good idea? Yes, I think it is. So if you get used to one sort of style, it's, it's usually good. So there we go. Two videos on it. Let's go. The boring guy. Okay, if I can get his vocabulary. That's fine. One second. We they work through calculus class. I think that a man messed it up. Obviously. Yeah. Everything is all so. <laughs> no. No, I don't think so. Okay, guys, sorry about that. I may have did break it. Yeah, uh huh, he's aboard. What does it look like? Three minutes. Oh, I remember. One second, I'm going to show Bluetooth devices here. One second. Ah, uh, where is it at? This guy here. Go on the right hand side. Don't be afraid, however, oh, yeah. to space those notes. Kind of synthesize a little bit. Don't write every single word that you. Okay, go back or no? Oh, he was okay. Maybe like right about here. Yeah. Okay. You guys ready real quick? Two videos and then we'll we'll jam with stuff. Hi, and welcome to this Mometrics tutoring session on how to write Cornell notes. Now we're just going to start with a sheet of paper, like you would for any type of note taking. It can be any type of sheet of paper, it might even have lines, and that's okay. As long as you have it large enough that you can take normal notes on. You're going to go ahead and take your sheet of paper. Now divide it into four quadrants or sections, just like this. Make sure you have only a little bit at the top, enough for maybe one or two lines at most. On the side, you're going to have a couple inches. For writing, uh, maybe a small notes. And on the bottom, you're going to have about the same size. Now on the far right, is going to be your largest section. And that's where most of your main notes are going to go. So keep that uh, for later, OK? After you've created those four sections, go ahead and at the top, title these notes. So whatever helps keep your mind Sorry. or your notes organized. Okay. Organize. Go ahead and put that information, whether it be your name, a class that you took, the subject of these notes, the date, whatever helps you, go ahead and do that. you've documented at the top of the page with those one or two lines about your name, the class you took, or whatnot, you're going to go ahead and take your main notes. Now, those go in the big section over on the right-hand side. Don't be afraid, however, to space those notes out. Kind of synthesize a little bit. Don't write every single word that you hear or read or, or watch in a video. Go ahead and try to just put the most important information there. Also, give yourself leeway. Skip every other line in case you have to come back and edit or put some like notes inside those margins. Don't be afraid to space it out. Give yourself some room. As soon as you finish taking the bulk of your notes over on the right-hand side, you're going to go and take some time to review and clarify. 
This simply means you're reviewing the notes that you've just taken, and now you're going to synthesize them even smaller to just the main points, the most important aspects of the lecture you just heard, the book you just read, whatnot. Go ahead and put those in the far left-hand side. Give yourself some space once again. Don't be afraid to skip every other line if you have to. Once we've reviewed our notes on the far right-hand side and then clarified them on the left-hand side, we're going to summarize down here at the bottom. Now, what does that look like? It's pretty straightforward. Imagine you've seen a movie and you want to describe it to your friends. How would you in one or two sentences describe that whole movie? Or perhaps you've been to a large Wikipedia page. At the top, they have a summarization of the next two to three pages. Go ahead and approach it that way. Which brings us to our last point study. We want to focus most of our time studying this left-hand column over here and our summarization down at the bottom. The left-hand column are all our key points, our main ideas that will likely end up on the test in the form of questions. The summarization at the bottom is an overarching storyline, essentially. It's the brief breakdown of whatever happened in the notes over on the right-hand side. Mastering both of those sections will set us up for the most success in the test. Good luck and thanks for watching. And a summary part, you don't need to do it at the end of each page if you don't want to, but definitely at the end of each note taking session or something like that. Okay, one more, one more video. This guy, and I'll cut him off just a little bit here. I thought this was kind of cool. So, how about uh, note taking as well as some graphics as well, kind of putting together here? He's, he's kind of like really exciting kind of guy. In this video, we're going to explore how to merge two different processes for taking notes the Cornell method and sketch noting. Let's get into it. Welcome to Verbal to Visual video. I am your host, Doug Neal, and I'm excited to dive into this specific topic today because I get questions from students in high school or college, but also teachers about how to bring visual note taking into the classroom. And I wanted to explore how we could start with a note taking system that students might already be familiar with, the Cornell method, and add into the Cornell method more visual tools, more sketch noting elements to make it an even more powerful combination. So if you are a student, my goal for you is that you can use this technique and take better notes during class. And if you're a teacher, I hope this gives you some ideas about how you as an instructor can help your students take better notes. Let's start with what standard Cornell notes look like. With this note-taking process, you divide the page into these four different sections. Up top, you have the space for the topic, your name, the date, those types of details. Then in the bigger section to the right, you take top to bottom in the moment notes. So these are the notes that you're taking during the lecture or while you're watching a video or reading a textbook. Then after the fact, you use the section on the left to pull out the key ideas that are contained within those in the moment notes. That's an opportunity for you to pull out the most important pieces and highlight them there on the left so that they're easier to reference in the future. Then in the bottom section, you add a one to two sentence summary of the ideas contained on this single page. The power of this note taking style is that when you go to review these notes, you know where to look to get the most most important ideas. It'll mostly be that smaller section on the left and the summary on the bottom. That's what you'll study. And then if you need to dig into your in the moment notes to find more details, you can do that, but only when you have to. So that's the Cornell method, a specific process for taking notes that has a structure regarding layout, how you're going to organize ideas on the page, and even has some process elements in terms of what you're doing while the information is first coming in, and then things that you can do after the fact to reinforce the most important ideas that you just learned. It's not by default overly visual though. So let's see what happens when we build some sketch noting elements into this Cornell method. This is Within that top section, you might consider adding a topical sketch, something related to the subject matter that you're about to take notes on. You might even add a calendar date to make that stand out a bit more. 
then write a large title with then maybe your name and some other info below it. Adding just a few visuals there to that top portion of your notes, not only will that make for nice quick references when you're reviewing these notes later, it can also help get your brain and your hand warmed up to doing something more visual, which we'll continue doing throughout the rest of these notes. Within that section for in the moment notes, you have a lot of flexibility. If you'd like, you can start off primarily using just text for your notes. Then maybe consider using dividers to break up the page a little bit as you move from one idea to the next. And as you move down the page, feel free to build in other elements when appropriate, like maybe adding an image or a diagram in addition to some text, or capture some details using a bulleted list. And if you come across a hierarchy, you could use a numbered list. Since that section is where you are capturing your in-the-moment notes, you might not always have a ton of time to do anything that's real detailed in terms of imagery. But even just giving yourself the option to do a quick sketch or diagram when you're able, that adds a little bit more dynamics and flexibility to your in-the-moment notes. And I think even just having the option of doing something more visual in your mind, it triggers a different type of processing power so that you're more active in the way that you're responding to the ideas. You're not just passively taking in information and on a laptop typing it word for word. You're actively processing that information, getting down as much of it as you can in a way that makes sense to you in your words and in your images. Then within that section to the left, still pull out the key ideas of each of those sections of your notes, but consider adding icons for quick reference, like a star when you're capturing a key idea or a little profile icon if you want to mention an important person. You could make these up as you go, but I think it's also worth spending some time developing your own custom set of icons. Icons that have a particular meaning to you that you can reuse. That way, when you're flipping back through these notes, it's easier to quickly find the particular piece of information that you're looking for. I think that this idea of creating your own custom set of icons works really well on the individual level if you're a student and you want to try that out. And I also think it could be a powerful thing for a teacher to do as a group within your classroom. Come up with a subject specific. I'm going to stop. In this video, we're going to explore how to stop. Okay. We're good there. Uh, thumbs up if you liked it. Thumbs sideways if it's like, yeah, whatever. Thumbs down if it's like, okay, I'm still here. Ooh, okay. Not not too cool. How come not too cool for the people who said not too cool? We did this in middle school. Okay, so it feels too <laughs> middle schoolish. No, didn't like it. Didn't like it. <laughs> didn't like middle school at all. No, 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 no. No, didn't like it in middle school. Oh, didn't like it in middle school. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. As opposed to more. Uh, I can never keep any kind of order in my notes if I sketch note anything. It feels like it breaks up all of the sentences. Gotcha. Okay. How interesting. I feel like the sketch noting option is just pretty time consuming. Mm -hmm. And, like, at least in most of our classes here, we don't have time to add a divider or something. We just yeah. Have to keep uh, right, right. As fast as possible. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. That's cool. Thank you so much for your feedback. That's awesome. Okay. And then what I'll do uh, each time, I'll just do um, like video of the day, like what I think is cool. Cool video of the day. How about that? This is a TED talk about engineering and it's going to be math specific, obviously, but I think it'd be kind of cool. Ready? So no taking notes yet. This is just a cool video to start the day. Uh, about four minutes, so we'll cut it off. How many of you are creatives? Designers, engineers, entrepreneurs, artists, or maybe you just have a really big imagination? Show of hands. Hey, that's most of you. I have some news for us creatives. Over the course of the next 20 years, more will change around the way we do our work than has happened in the last 2000. In fact, I think we're at the dawn of a new age in human history. Now, there've been four major historical eras defined by the way we work. The hunter-gatherer age lasted several million years. 
And then the agricultural age lasted several thousand years. The industrial age lasted a couple of centuries. And now the information age has lasted just a few decades. And now today, we're on the cusp of our next great era as a species. Welcome to the augmented age. In this new era, your natural human capabilities are gonna be augmented by computational systems that help you think, robotic systems that help you make, and digital nervous system that connects you to the world far beyond your natural senses. Let's start with cognitive augmentation. How many of you are augmented cyborgs? I would actually argue that we're already augmented. Imagine you're at a party and somebody asks you a question that you don't know the answer to. If you have one of these, in a few seconds, you can know the answer. But this is just a primitive beginning. Even Siri is just a passive tool. In fact, for the last three and a half million years, the tools that we've had have been completely passive. They do exactly what we tell them and nothing more. Our very first tool only cut where we struck it. The chisel only carves where the artist points it. And even our most advanced tools do nothing without our explicit direction. In fact, to date, and this is something that frustrates me, we've always been limited by this need to manually push our wills into our tools, like manually, literally using our hands, even with computers. But I'm more like Scotty in Star Trek. I want to have a conversation with the computer, right? I want to say, computer, let's design a car. And the computer shows me a car. And I say, no, more fast looking and less German. And bang, the computer shows me an option. <laughs> now that conversation might be a little ways off. It's actually probably less than many of us think. But right now, uh, we're working on it. Tools are making this leap from being passive to being generative. Generative design tools use a computer and algorithms to synthesize geometry, to come up with new designs all by themselves. All it needs are your goals and your constraints. I'll give you an example. In the case of this aerial drone chassis, all you would need to do is tell it something like it has four propellers, you want it to be as lightweight as possible, and you need it to be aerodynamically efficient. And then what the computer does is it explores the entire solution space every single possibility that solves and meets your criteria, millions of them. It takes big computers to do this, but it comes back to us with designs that we by ourselves never could have imagined. And the computer is coming up with this stuff all by itself. No one ever drew anything and it started completely from scratch. And by the way, it's no accident that the drone body looks just like the pelvis of a flying squirrel. <laughs> Stop there. <laughs> but that's kind of cool. So you have this, uh, it's not AI, full AI, right? But it's like, here's your constraints now, try to figure out. And um, anyways, cool video of the day. How about that? It's like text generating AI. Say again, say again. It's like an AI that can write something that has never been written before. Uh huh. Yeah, in a, in a geometric framework. Right. So interesting, are drones made like this? That does not look like a drone that I see ever. Say again? That's right, yeah. So covered in casing. Then the question is, would the inside or the guts look like that? That may be, yeah. What is that, camera hold right here probably or something like that, or the, the battery hold? You put it in? Interesting. Anyway, I thought that was kind of fun. Okay, now let's jam. So this is 1.1. Okay, so Cornell notes if you don't think it's icky from middle school or uh, or however you think you would best do that. Thanks, guys, for your feedback, though. I didn't think about the sketching taking longer. Okay, so 1.1, we get into... rectangular quadrants, remembering this. So we're gonna do a lot of graphing in chapter one. Chapter one is a uh, review of that. So let's jam, here it is. Okay. Seen that before, I think. And this is the rectangular coordinate system. It is has an X axis, it has a Y axis. 
And that little guy in the middle is called the origin. origin. Awesome. Yep. Origin. Cool. And then let's see, beyond that, we have um, these different quadrants, I believe. Remember quadrants? Talk to me here. Which way do they go? Which one's where? Where's quadrant one? Top right. Top right. There's your quadrant one. Oh, sorry, real quick here. We always do this here. We put X and Y, right? A little dot. X is always the first coordinate. Y is always the second coordinate. So the horizontal movement is first. Vertical movement is last. And then quadrant one is good. Upper right is quadrant one. Quadrant two. It's upper left. Left, I go with that. And uh, what makes it special in quadrant one is the fact that the X is positive, Y is positive. So it's really the signs, where the signs are. Quadrant two, boom, how about a negative positive coordinate? The X is going to be negative in this quadrant. The Y is going to be positive. This feeds in so well into trigonometry, which you guys will all take next year because it's, it's gonna be such a fun class. Quadrant three in the lower bottom, and that is a negative negative. And last one here, quadrant four is a positive negative. X is positive, Y is negative at that point. And we do some cool tricks in trigonometry to make it a little faster for us to find the trigonometric values, which is kind of cool. Okay, and this is where I say mathematics is cool in of its own self, but then at the same time, it lets us think about other things as well. And so, and also tell me if I'm going too fast, just kind of raise your hand. So Mr. Ridge, if you can go backwards real quick here, I'll, I'll go back, no problem. Okay, so uh, where's this sort of four pattern sort of used at, at, other than mathematics? Oh, sorry, real quick, Cornell notes. And I may dump this as well, but let's see here. If you guys don't like it, we'll switch to something else. We good? It's no problem here, but the coordinate plane is what we're talking about right here. And like by the end of the week, tell me if we want to continue Cornell notes. If not, then we'll do something else. We're good. Or just we'll just plain notes is fine too. Okay, let's jam. That's a coordinate plane. Where's this used at? Now, if you if that little Cornell outline is not here, that means you don't need to take notes on it. We're good. This is just for, for us to contemplate here. Uh, anybody read Robert Kiyosaki's book or poor rich dad, poor dad? Anybody heard of that even before? One? Okay, that's cool. Uh, he thinks of he thinks of uh, your career choice or your job choice in one of these four quadrants. So it starts off here, an employee, you have a job. Uh, Self-employed is that you own the job. Uh, business owner means you own a system, right, of, of a job that's working for you. And then you have the investor, which invests and then uh, stock market or other adventures or even... Um, businesses themselves here, the venture capitalists and stuff. Cool. Okay, four quadrants, is that good? And that's the way we sort of think about career choices here. Just out of curiosity here, how many uh, see yourself in the future? Like, you know what? I love to have a job at this company and I like to be there. Okay. <laughs> how many see yourself in the future like self-employed? I really want to do this. I want to work for myself doing this. That's cool, okay. Yeah, sort of. Well, we can we can do the uh, we can do the uh, I am a sophomore. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Mr. G, if you want me to talk about career choices already in my life? Uh, business owner. How many would like to actually own like a franchise or a whole bunch of businesses? That's so ambitious. Two or more. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. And then how about uh, investor? You work that capital for other people to start the business or stock market or something like that. Okay, that's cool. That runs together. And, and again, these four pieces are the four different options in a rough sketch. And what Robert Kiyosaki is really talking about is the fact that each one of these uh, four quadrants have their own mindset of thinking. You gotta be thinking in this mindset. It has its own tax laws if you wanna, and, if, and it has its own way of retiring out of. And so, if you go into that, you better know sort of the rules of the game of that quadrant. Which I thought that's that's pretty cool. Okay, and then anybody taking this here? It's called the politicalcompass.com. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, this is kind of cool. It just uh, where, where you fall into. We were uh, during a road trip during summer, um, the six of us, as we were driving, uh, our oldest daughter said, hey, dad, there's this little thing you can take a quiz and where you at uh, politically like, okay, that's fine. So we all took, we all took the quiz and stuff. That was kind of fun. So there it is. It's uh, based upon economics. What's your view of economics? And then what's your view of, uh, in a sense, governmental control right here, authoritarian or completely liberal. Anyways, that's kind of cool. The only problem with that test is some of the questions were like tax laws. And I was like, uh huh. Oh, well, my uh, younger kids did not, um, they didn't get this because some of them were actually quotes from political philosophers and they didn't kind of get the quote because, you know, you say a quote, but it actually means something, right? And like, so there's that. Noah? What about the dead center? Do they have a dead center for that? I mean, you could centrist. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, completely centrist. Yeah. Uh, you should be able to land in the center because you have, you know, you have two ways of going, right? You have two grids, that, yeah. so you should be able to land in the center. Maybe the fun part is trying to figure out the question. Does that mean you don't have opinions? <laughs> like you're kind of well, I assume you're perfectly balance each other out. Like you're perfect. Like you still have to answer the questions. So you have to have an opinion, right? So yeah, but what if you answer at that point, like, hmm. just modern. Don't have to be, you have to figure out which questions get you on which side of the graph. Uh -huh. Okay, let's jam here. So uh, the notes are going to go like this here. So I, I did, it says exercise three through six. So I get the instructions right from the textbook. So at least you have that. Don't need to write down exercises one through six. You're good? If you want to write down the instructions, then you put plot the points in the Cartesian plane. You're good? So that's kind of... So if you want to write down instructions on your notes, go ahead, do it now. You would just write down this little piece right here only. And the way, the reason why it's called a Cartesian coordinate is because there's a philosopher, a guy by the name of Descartes. He's the guy that actually came up with it. And this is very recent. This Cartesian coordinate system that we think is like been around for years and years is only 500 years old. Uh, Descartes, he's the philosopher who said, I think therefore, I am. I am. That's the same guy. He was a philosopher. He was a mathematician. He was a professor at university. And what happened before this, before 1500 AD, um, geometry was geometry. You guys had geometry, right? It's like there's no numbers and you use this compass and you use the straight edge and you make stuff. That was Greek geometry. And then you had algebra. Algebra was the process of solving stuff. And those two were actually two different worlds. You did not ever combine those together. And so Descartes, he said, that's fun. How about if I, in fact, the, the history note is that he was looking at a fly on the ceiling one day. <laughs> yeah, true, true. And uh, he figured like, if, is, can I explain to another person exactly the pinpoint location of that fly? And how would I do that? So he figured from the corner, I can probably go out so many feet up, right? And from the other corner, I can go so many feet across and I can pinpoint that fly. And lo and behold, geometry and algebra were fused together from there. So instead of just saying a fly on the ceiling, it's a big ceiling. It's a big ceiling, yeah. Instead of like right there. But this, I think this is the whole point of being, for, uh, for Descartes, really, it's the whole point of actually being almost like a genius. You see something and you see it a whole new light that nobody else sees it that way. And, and you wonder, hmm, okay, that, <laughs> a different thought there. Okay, let's jam here. So all yours, let me erase this. Everybody good with drawing this little guy again. And I'm looking at X's and Y's. I see the biggest number here is four. So I assume I'm just gonna go out four. Maybe I'll go out five, but I'll go out one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's as much space as I need to plot all my points. And I got zero, zero. And I'll let you guys do it first, go for it. Put a little dots there where you need them. And then if you're okay with four, I'll let you guys try six by yourself and have fun. All right, and if you have no paper, if you, like in my mind, if you have the quad rule paper, that would probably be the best since we're gonna do a lot of graphing. 
If you don't have it, you want to just do it on sketch line paper, that's fine too. It's up for you guys. No. Grapple, yeah, uh-huh. Quadrules. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. This stuff should be easy. Chapter one, section one, two, and three should be pretty just kind of remembering stuff from algebra. So if you're bored out of your mind, you're doing great. <clears throat> Uh, what usually happens in the, in the book, the way it's formulated, is these are the first two, three sections of each chapter is like old information, and then it starts gearing up into like algebra two-ish kind of stuff. So we start off easy and we kind of move our way into something more difficult. So that's the bear to the first three sections. Okay, everybody okay with three, one being over here? Uh, negative two means you go left two down four so somewhere over here and they got a one negative one which would be right over here if yours graph matches my graph we're in good shape did i do something wrong no it's four it wasn't yeah okay and math teacher can't do math so not that but about here about right here will that be better yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Scared you guys, huh? Yeah. This is good. All right. Okay. And the next one. Who's done with six already? Raise your hand if you're done with six already. Okay. Cool. All yours with six. One and negative one third. Can you plot that little guy down? Three fourths and three. If it gets really boring, I'm going to sing Jeopardy. Please the last number. Uh, negative three fourths, comma, negative three halves. So. Negative three fourths. Negative. Negative. Uh, it's negative three halves, so three over two. No. How about this? Oh, this is so cool. Technology. Ooh, here you go, Noah. How about this? Whoa. That good enough for you there? I know it's saying what you really see. Thank you. Uh-huh, sure. All right. And let's see. The highest number again is four. So I'm gonna go out one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Cool. And then I got myself, let's see, a one out this way. And then go down a third. Everybody okay there? Cool. Uh, three fourths, which means not really close to one yet, but then up three. So three fourths of the way to one. And then one, two, three, up here somewhere, somewhere ish. Uh, negative three up four, about right there in quadrant two. And the fun part, negative four thirds is what? Negative one and one third? Yeah. So negative one and one third, and then down one and a half. So somewhere about right there-ish is what you should get there. Okay, what is this called here? It's called plotting points, because that's what we're doing here. This is just plotting points or plotting individual points, which is different when we plot a line. Line is different because we start off with the y-axis and we go from there. Okay. And I think we can probably get this far. Uh, again, tell me if I'm going too fast. If not, I'll just keep on going. Next one is determine the quadrants which each of these guys are located. And there's kind of two different ways we think about it here. One is the whole entire quadrant itself, and then uh, part like partial quadrants here. So we got two different types. And so the way I think about 12 is like this. I say, well, give me all the quadrants where X is less than zero, where I had negative values for X. What do you guys say? Which is two quadrants do it? Quadrant three and one. Three and one? 
two. two. Big deal, yeah. Big three and two or two and three, is that right? That's when the x's are negative? Yeah. And then when are the y values negative as well? Three and four. So I got two check marks in quadrant three. So it's going to be quadrant three as I add in this right here. See, right there. That's a three. Cool. All right. That's uh, full quadrants. Partial quadrants go like this here. So when is x greater than four? Which quadrants would x be greater than four? In this day, as I go out to four, it's gonna be have to be bigger than four. So sometimes it'll end up here and some, sometimes it'll end up down here. And so that means there'll be quadrants. There's actually two of them, quadrants one and quadrants four. Okay. Okay, are we good there? Okay, so uh, notice that exercises one through 11 through 20 is done. So if you're on your sheet of paper like this, if you wanna mark off up to 20, not going past 20. So you can mark off one, three, 11, 15, as as far as we got today. And so that homework, now when you're gonna, when I'm gonna collect homework, that's gonna be when all of 1.1 is done. We good? So at least you can. Yes, uh-huh. Okay. You can start on the vocabulary. You may not be able to do all the vocabulary, okay. right? But at least one, three, eleven, fifteen is the start. Okay. All right. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Uh,